one set of brothers would be murdered by another set of brothers in a story where just hanging out in the woods leads to something bad. Hello, true crimers. This is the case of the Gitche Manitou State Park murders. Viewer discretion is advised. <laughs> Gitche Manitou is technically a state preserve, I guess, mainly a wildlife reserve. It's not so much considered like a public park, but uh, it would be frequently used uh, as a park and people would go there to camp. People would go there to just sort of hang out kind of in a desolate place to, you know, smoke some weed, drink, you know, kids being kids, teens being teens. It's located in Lyon County, Iowa. It's just like right past the border of Sioux Falls, South Dakota. And this will be the location of one of the most famous mass murders in the history of Iowa. Stuart and Dana Beatty were two of five total siblings. The two of them were really close brothers. Dana was the youngest sibling of all of them. Stuart Beatty was born on June 6, 1955 in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Growing up, he was described as a super laid back young man, uh, very chill, uh, very calm demeanor. He had a lot of friends. He was someone who was just a super sociable kid. He also had this blue van that he absolutely loved. It was like his prized possession next to like his guitars because he loved playing guitar. And he would take any opportunity he could to drive this van around. So anytime anyone needed a ride, a friend needed a ride, family, he'd be like, ah, oh, I'll do it. <laughs> His youngest brother, Dana Beatty, was born on uh, July 28th, 1959, also in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Dana Beatty absolutely adored his older brother, Stuart. They were two very, very close brothers. Around the time that this unfortunate case happens, Stuart is actually teaching his brother Dana how to play guitar. Dana now has his own guitar and he loves practicing it. He loves playing and he is a very quick learner and he thinks that his brother is just like the best teacher in the world. Any opportunity he had to hang out with Stuart he would take it. The Beatys were uh, friends with many uh, kids in the area. One of them was 15-year-old Michael Hadrith. He would go by Mike to everyone. I could relate. I hate being called Michael. Mike was born on October 16th, 1958. He was actually born originally in uh, Chippewa County, Minnesota. Mike was someone who was considered to be very, very close with his family. One of his sisters was like his absolute best friend. Um, they adored being around each other. And everyone said Mike had this great big heart. He was just a super loving guy who would make sure that anyone was doing okay. And if they weren't doing okay, he would do anything to make them feel better. Another one of the Beatty's friends was 17-year-old Roger Essam. Roger Essam was born on May 31st, 1956 in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Of this like group of friends, he seemed to be the one with the biggest personality, the most, I guess, the loudest one of all of them. He was arguably just the most fun person to be around. He loved to just have fun and make sure everything wasn't being taken just so seriously all the time. He was described as someone who always seemed to be in just a really good mood. He usually was just had a smile across his face and he knew how to, you know, make a gathering or a party really feel festive and really feel alive. It was the morning of November 18th, 1973. A young couple was driving across the South Dakota, Iowa border and they were going into the, the Gitche Manitou State Reserve. As they're driving, they see something that kind of sticks out to them, something just doesn't look right it's unusual at first it looks like they're like just mannequins thrown into onto the ground just sort of chilling there so they get out of their car they approach what they thought was mannequins or just something trash or whatever and when they get closer they realize these are not mannequins these are people and these are deceased people there was three of them kind of lined up in a row 
and they all appear to have blood just kind of pooling underneath their their bodies. Um, it, just at first glance, it looks like they had been shot. And by the way they were positioned, it looks almost like execution style. So they get in their car because this is before cell phones. They go to the nearest place that they can reach an actual police officer and they get police out to the Gitche Manitou State Reserve. And the police confirm that the bodies were kind of in this like uh, fields, uh, in a very open field. And there was like this pathway where it, it almost looked like, if they looked at the gravel road, I guess, it looked like these bodies had been dragged down this road and sort of veered off to the right of this path. And that's where the bodies were just kind of put. As they are searching the area, they notice another body um, f away, like far away from these three bodies. It's just one individual now also who appeared to be shot to death. All four victims looked to be very, very young. I mean, these were like teenagers. Around each body, they did find uh, casings, shotgun shell casings, and they would determine that they were um, 12 gauge, 16 gauge, and 20 gauge. So they easily figured out that there were three different weapons used. So which would mean possibly three different killers uh, had fired a shotgun killing these four young men. The boys were quickly identified. 18-year-old Stuart Beatty, 14-year-old Dana Beatty, 15-year-old Mike Hadrith. Those are the three that were found together. And then the individual who was found separately down the path was 17-year-old Roger Essam. The families were notified right away, and they, this is when police learned that Stewart drove this blue van, but when police were at the scene searching it, there was no sign of a blue van, um, nothing at all. They had, there was actually no vehicles there. So they didn't, at first, they didn't even know how the boys got there, but then they found out that they must have gotten there in Stewart's blue van because they did see some tire tracks there to indicate that there were, that there was a vehicle there, you know, recently, but they couldn't find the van. So they're searching everywhere. They're looking all over the place around the, the, the state reserve, the city surrounding it, you know, they're looking into the Iowa border, the South Dakota border, in the neighborhoods these kids lived in, can't find the van anywhere. And there really wasn't much physical evidence left behind. There weren't anything that they could get fingerprints from. There were only the shell casings, which didn't have fingerprints on them when they're being loaded into the shotguns. Um, there was no like uh, DNA found that didn't belong to the four victims, but this is also 1973 where DNA wasn't really a thing. There wasn't like any foreign hair samples found. I mean, there was nothing. They found a little, what looked like a little campsite uh, with a guitar resting against a tree, and they determined that, that was Stuart Beatty's guitar. Um, so the police kind of figured uh, that they had probably, these four boys had probably gone there to hang out, play guitar, just like a lot of teenagers did in that area. Uh, but nothing was found on the guitar. Nothing was found at this little campsite that would indicate who may have done this horrible act. And they were just at a loss. Uh, they had nothing. And then... About 20 hours after the murders likely took place, a young girl walks into the Sioux Falls Police Department. This girl is 13-year-old Sandra Chesky. Sandra Chesky was one of four siblings. Uh, she had three older brothers. She was the youngest of the group. Sandra, just like the other four boys, uh, was extremely well-behaved. She never got into any kind of trouble. The four boys who were found literally never got in any kind of trouble. All of them got good grades. They were all considered very well behaved. Sandra came from a really, really good background, really loving and supporting family. She had actually met 17-year-old Roger Essam about a month prior to this happening. She was 13, he was 17, but the two of them became very close very fast and essentially became boyfriend and girlfriend. Sandra would say that it was basically love at first sight for both of them. So what does she tell police? Because they don't know what she has to do with any of this, even though she was, you know, the girlfriend of one of the victims. Well, she tells a story. It was the evening of November 17th, 1973, so the night before the bodies are found. 
Roger SM calls his girlfriend Sandra and says, hey, I'm gonna be hanging out with, uh, you know, with like Stuart and, and Mike um, and uh, Stuart's little brother, Dana. We're gonna go just like hang out at Gitchy Manitou. We're gonna play guitar, hang out. I brought a joint so we can smoke. Um, and so, and, she, and he asked like, hey, do you wanna come along? And she's like, yeah, of course, I wanna come along. She wanted anything, to, she wanted basically anything and everything to do with Roger. She was wanted to be around him because she loved him that much. So basically, all five of these teenagers now, they meet up, they get into Stewart's blue van, and sometime around 10 p.m., 10.30 p.m. is when they actually get to Gitchy Manitou Park. Sandra says when they arrived, it was just them. There was no other vehicles parked. Uh, there was no sign of anyone else there at all. Sandra described it as just a really calm and fun evening. And... They had just sort of, they built a little fire. Stuart got out his guitar, he started playing it. They were just laughing, passing the joint around, um, and they were just having a good time. It was, as Sandra described it, the perfect night, until it wasn't. Roughly 30 to 40 minutes into this very calm and relaxing evening, the five teenagers started to hear the sounds of branches cracking in the nearby woods. It sounded like someone was walking across, you know, fallen down branches and they were making just some sort of very subtle sounds. Roger SM begins to call out like, hey, who's there? Come out, like what's going on? But no one comes out. So Roger gets up and he kind of walks towards where the noise is happening. And then the other four teenagers who are still at the campfire, they hear a loud gunshot. The four of them get up, they're like, what the hell just happened? And that's when three uh, men come out of the woods, each one of them holding a shotgun. Mike Hadrith begins to like argue, like, who are you guys? And he like puts his hand up and one of the guys shoots the shotgun and shoots Mike through his hand. These three guys basically come out and say, listen, we're with the DEA, we're with the police or whatever. Uh, we see you guys have a joint and so we're here to bust you. None of them were wearing any official like police clothing. They were all in just normal clothes. But these were kids, especially Sandra. She was only 13, very naive. They didn't really know. And so at first they were kind of believing them. So these three men uh, basically point the shotguns at all of these other four teenagers because now Roger is down. He's, they don't even know what happened to him. Um, and they march the four teens back to Stewart's van. And they basically say, listen, we're, we're here to bust you, you're under arrest, blah, blah, blah. One of these three individuals is being referred to as the boss. And when they get to the van, they also, the, the four teenagers also see a pickup truck. And this is when the boss tells Sandra, the 13 year old girl, to get into the truck and he does so at gunpoint, and so she gets in, he then gets in, and he just takes off. This guy just basically just kidnaps Sandra. In the truck, he keeps telling her, he keeps trying to reassure her that, you know, she's gonna be fine, they're gonna be fine. They weren't real shotgun shells. They were, the guns were all loaded with tranquilizers, and so that's why the other guy went down right away, because the tranquilizer took effect. Um, you know, we missed your other friend, we shot him in the hand, oops. Again, she's 13, naive, she's believing this, kind of. But as, as this boss person is driving away in the truck, Sandra turns around and she sees, because she was told that the, her three friends were gonna be loaded into the van and taken somewhere. But what she sees actually is two of these men holding shotguns up to these three other, her three friends and walking them away from the van. And that would be the last time she would ever see them alive again. Sandra and the boss are driving around this area just sort of aimlessly for what she thinks is hours um, until they eventually get to what looks like an abandoned like farmhouse. When they pull up to this farmhouse, that's when Sandra notices Stewart's blue van and there are some people standing outside of it. But when they get really close, they notice that it's actually the other two men who were the assailants back at Gitchi Manitou. She doesn't see her friends anywhere. So the boss gets out of the truck. He approaches his two friends. And one of the three men is like this sort of heavier set guy with like this little mustache. And 
he's like kind of talking to the boss and they're like pointing towards the the truck into at Sandra. So the the heavier set guy walks towards the truck. He gets in the truck and he wastes no time. He just sexually assaults the 13-year-old girl right then right there in the truck. Then when he's done, he gets out. The boss gets back into the truck and basically looks at this hysterical young girl now who has just gone through so much trauma and said, you know, if you tell anyone what happened here tonight, I'm going to kill you. We're going to kill you. And he asks her where she lives. And so they drive to her house and unbelievably, he lets her out of the truck and lets her go back into her house where he tells her one more time, remember, if you say anything, I will kill you. So, you know, she, within 20 hours of all of this happening, she finally works up the courage to let her parents know what happened. They take her to the Sioux Falls Police Department, and that's when she relays this entire story. So now they have something to go with. They have an eyewitness to the murders of these four boys they had found earlier. She got a good look at all three of these individuals, and so they were able to make um, some composite drawings of all three of them. Kind of creepy looking, uh, as most composite drawings tend to be. But she was able to describe them with pretty good detail. She also described the truck as being something like a, like a Chevrolet truck, as best as she could tell. Um, within a couple of days of the murders happening, within like one or two days, they found Stewart's blue van just parked in a random parking lot. And they forensically analyzed this truck like crazy. They, they dusted it for fingerprints, checked for anything and everything they could find, but there was nothing in it. No signs of anyone other than Stewart and his friends. There was no indication of anyone else. No fingerprints, hair samples, nothing left behind, nothing. For the next almost two weeks, on a daily basis, Sandra gets into a police vehicle with any one of the detectives working on this case because they want to see if they can find the farmhouse that she was brought to. So they get this grid set up. They take a map and they grid it off and they like search each grid box um, every day. And it's like a several miles by several mile grid search for each one. And for the first 11 days, they find nothing. She can't, she doesn't recognize the barn anywhere. Uh, but it's finally on the 12th day just shortly after Thanksgiving is when they are driving and she goes, oh my God, that's the farmhouse. And she, she says with an absolute certainty, this is where they brought me. This is where they sexually assaulted me. So they pull up next to it. It's definitely abandoned. No one had lived in this farmhouse for a very long time. So they all get out of the vehicle to search. And as they're getting out of the police vehicle, a Chevrolet pickup drives up to the farmhouse. Sandra immediately grabs onto one of the deputies, bear hugs him, and points at the truck and says, that's him, that's the boss, that's the guy, that's the boss, get him. And so the guy in the truck sees what's happening and he backs up and then one of the deputies gets into the police vehicle and chases him down and manages to get him to stop. And so... They get him out of the vehicle, and the individual turns out to be a man by the name of Alan Fryer. The Fryers were a very, very large family there on the border of uh, South Dakota and Iowa. There were obviously the parents, but then there were seven boys and six girls. Super big family. They were uh, well known in the community. Um, half of the kids were really well behaved and seemed to be pretty normal. But there were a chunk of them that definitely were not well behaved and were troublemakers. The family owned a massive portion of land and on that land they had their own little house and their father was very, very strict. He uh, constantly scolded the kids, specifically three of the boys he seemed to kind of really hone in on in terms of like really beating them down mentally. He didn't even refer to these three sons of his as his sons. He referred to them as the chore boys. Alan Fryer was one of the older siblings. He was the loudest of them, meaning he had like the biggest personality of all of them. He wasn't afraid of much. 
he was someone who would just constantly tell tall tales. He would lie about everything. He would over embellish things to people. Uh, and he absolutely loved his shotgun. Uh, loved it like it was uh, his own child. David Fryer was younger um, and he seemed to be always just a super dreary person. Had a very like comatose or, or somber kind of mood always. He was someone they said just sulked around all the time. Just like, woe is me. He was also a follower. He became Alan's like little minion, like his little puppet. He would do anything Alan told him to do. James Fryer was the more violent of the three brothers, of these, this particular three brothers. He was always angry, just like constantly in a state of anger. Always just mad at everyone, um, hated everyone, it seemed like. He was the one who kind of first started getting into trouble with the law. He would steal cars. Um, he would like commit minor assaults. Like he was just always getting in trouble. But his behavior began to rub off on the other, on Alan and David especially. And the trio, they began to kind of commit crimes together. Stealing and assaulting. And they one time shot someone with a rifle. They didn't die. Um, and they really didn't get in much trouble for it either. But when these three brothers were together, they were a problem. They were always a problem. So police ask Alan, hey, uh, where were you the other night? And at first he's denying everything. Like I had nothing to do with those murders. I don't know who this girl is. Sandra, she was confident. This was him. This was the boss. This was the guy who drove me around in the truck. I know it, that's the truck. I brought you to the farmhouse where he ended up driving to without knowing we were here, it was all pretty, pretty clear. And so that same morning, they would end up arresting Alan. They would later track down David Fryer and they arrested him. And then they found out that James Fryer was actually already in jail. And so when they approached him, he was like, well, I don't know what you're talking about. I've been in jail because he was in there for like burglary or something. Um, so I couldn't have been involved in this. I wasn't there, I was in jail. Uh, but the police quickly learned that, nope, that's not necessarily true because they found out that James, well, he was also on work release, meaning he was allowed to leave the jail uh, to go to work. And so when they looked into this, he in fact was out of jail the night that the murders took place. So now they knew he could have definitely been there at the murder scene. Eventually, the three of them are kind of questioned individually and they all start to kind of turn on each other like, no, James did it or David did it all or Alan did it all or, you know, the two of them did it. I didn't do anything. It was just a lot of back and forths. Police weren't getting a straight story. Uh, however, they did have a police lineup and Sandra did identify all three brothers uh, without hesitation, and she said that it was James who was the one to have sexually assaulted her in the pickup truck. And for that, she was absolutely certain. Then they started to give stories like, well, those teenagers, they shot at us first, and so we were just shooting back, like we were defending ourselves. Which was obviously nonsense because they didn't find any other guns at the crime. They found no guns at the crime scene. Uh, they found no guns in the blue van. They found no guns in the pickup truck. They didn't find any additional guns other than the guns that the friars already owned themselves. So they knew that was just ridiculous. They asked them, what were you guys doing? Like, what, what, why were you at Gitchy Manitou that night? And so eventually one of them says, we were just out deer hunting. We wanted to go out and hunt some deers, not for food and not for sports. They wanted to go out there, hunt deers, literally for the sake of killing something. That's what one of them said. We just like killing animals. Great people. That's when they said they stumbled across the five teenagers. They saw and smelled the marijuana and they figured maybe they have more drugs. When Roger Essam got up to investigate, that's when he was shot dead, basically right there on the spot. James had shot at Stewart, who injured Stewart originally. Alan was the one who shot Mike Hadra through the hand. After that, that's when Alan took Sandra to the pickup truck and left. Then James and David were left with the remaining three teenagers, and they basically said they lined them up, and David shot and killed Stuart Beatty. James had shot and killed Mike Hadrath, and also shot and killed Dana Beatty. 
So a pair of brothers was murdered at the same time by another pair of brothers. They then just dragged their bodies to a more, uh, I guess, open part of this field. And they just took off in the blue van. They met Alan at the farmhouse. And that's when James decided to sexually assault the 13-year-old girl. And then they just dropped her off at home. So by June 20th, 1974, all three boys are now basically in lockup at the sheriff's station. This is because they were awaiting their trials. Alan had basically crafted his own wrench out of like wires that he found in his cell. And he managed to unscrew some bolts and he managed to break out of his cell. He then managed to get some keys. I don't know where any of these sheriff's people were, but he managed to get the keys to get his brother um, uh, James out with him and they escaped. So now police are like, we got to protect Sandra at all costs. We got to protect everyone at all costs because they don't know what's going to happen. But it didn't take long. Uh, less than, uh, I guess, a day later, 522 miles away in Gillette, Wyoming, the two escaped brothers were found and they were reapprehended. By this time, uh, David Fryer had already gone on trial because his trial was February of 1974. Uh, he was found guilty and he was sentenced to life in prison without parole. Allen went on trial after the whole escape debacle um, and then he was found guilty on all charges um, and he too was sentenced to life in prison without parole. And then in December of 1974, James Fryer also went on trial. They were all tried separately. He was too found guilty and sentenced to life in prison without parole. And they get to still be brothers together uh, because they were all sentenced to the, uh, the Iowa State Penitentiary. And that's where they all serve their sentences together. So at least they get to hang out still, right? And for what? They, there really wasn't truly a motive. It was just they ran into these teenagers and they just felt like killing something. It could have been because they thought they had more drugs. That could just be one of the many reasons. They These were troublesome kids um, who just liked getting into trouble together. I think if this is just a case of they wanted to assert power over a group of kids, and they did it. Um, they thought they would get away with it, but they left a witness, uh, which was really stupid of them to do, but thankfully they did. Sandra Chesky, uh, to many people, is really kind of a hero uh, for enduring what she endured, surviving what she went through, and then having the courage to finally go to police so quickly, actually, after she was threatened multiple times, like, if you say anything, we're going to murder you. But she went anyway. Um, and because of her, because of everything she did to help police, they caught these three monsters. And so she is uh, she should absolutely be commended for everything she did i just wish that her four friends were still alive to be there with her they were all just victims of wrong place wrong time and those are usually just the most sad of these types of stories they were just wanting to have fun hang out smoke a joint play guitar they were good kids all of them none of them deserved what they got but thankfully their killers were caught quickly and now they can all rest in peace. But that is it for this video, True Crime Maroonies. I hope you found it interesting. As usual, if you have tripped, fallen, and stumbled your way into this video, hello, I'm Mike. I tell true crime stories here, obviously. Uh, I tell them here, also over on TikTok. So please subscribe to me here, give this video a like. And then if you want to follow me on TikTok, it's linked in the link tree below in the description below. Next, if you have a case you want me to cover, just email me the name of the person, where it happened and when it happened. You can find the email in the description. Uh, and then I will add it to my list eventually. I pick my cases at random, so I can't tell you exactly when I'll cover that case, but I will eventually. Next, if you want to support me in any way, we do sell merch like this, t-shirts, hoodies, wine glass, stuff like that. We do ship internationally all over the world. Um, it's also linked below if you want to. And then lastly, if you have a Discord account and you want to join my Discord server, it's also linked below. Yeah, well, very repetitive here. Uh, please be over the age of 18 or else you're going to be kicked out of there. Sorry, not sorry. But that's it. We are done with this video. 
We are done with... That was a weird way to say that. We're done. All right, we're done. We're done here. Get out. Why am I being so aggressive? That is not how you say goodbye to the people who enjoy your content. Mike. I forgot where I was. I forgot who I am. What? <laughs> Bye. <laughs>